Hey, Marzoli, how you doing? I'm good. How are you doing? Uh, could be better, could be worse. Uh, very grateful a power outage didn't happen. There were some very heavy rains in my area and a oh, wow, few okay. power lines, but luckily it didn't knock us out, so I'm glad I'm able to speak to you today. Uh, this is audio only, uh, just so you know, so you don't have to have your Skype camera on. You can. It might actually be better to turn it off because that'll only help with the uh, reception. There we go. Okay, uh, if you only want to go an hour, that's perfectly fine with me. I did uh, earlier this week watch two um, uh talks that you gave on the higher strangeness or is it high strangeness youtube channel that were uploaded to that channel back in um or it was the summertime uh, august or so one was about um ufos and ets and the other one was about a uh, biblical stuff the nephilim and uh end times uh prophecy and such so i guess we'll maybe spend uh half half and half on this interview half about ets and aliens the other half on the bible and uh the nephilim and try to mix some stuff in as well so uh since we've only got an hour i don't really want to get too much into your uh to your life story a lot of people can research that on other things but uh so let's get started um in regards to uh ufos and ets well i think i might as well give you the floor to give out the uh important information that you want people to know about regarding ufos and um ets i got my little notepad here to jot down anything that i think is uh important that you say that we could perhaps elaborate on so uh what do you want the human race to know about the whole <laughs> et and ufo phenomenon uh this is going to be for the first half hour of this uh, program go ahead well first of all thanks for having me on really appreciate it um you know it we crossed a line uh in december and I've written, I've, I've written blogs about it. I've done, pr produced a couple YouTube videos, which is on my video channel, L.A. Marzulli. Go there and subscribe. Thank you very much. And I, I do that like twice a week. There's Acceleration Radio on KGRA, which is an hour program. It's a radio show, but I have film it in the studio. So then the following day, we take the clip and we expand on that. And that becomes a really not the typical YouTube video because it's in a real studio. And then we do PPS Report. And I, I talked about disclosure on both of these, Acceleration Radio and Politics, Prophecy, and the Supernatural Report, PPS Report. In December of 2017, there was disclosure, and it happened three different times. Um, we had Harry Reid coming out and telling us that there was a secret government fund to study and research UFOs. Well, what does that mean? And how? just how is Harry Reid and the crew studying and researching UFOs if they don't exist? The second was Area 51. The government came out and said Area 51 exists. The third and perhaps the most revealing part of disclosure was from a former F-18 fighter pilot by the name of Fravor. And this military guy, this Air Force guy, um, fly, Flyboy, um, stated that he had an encounter with an unidentified flying object off the coast of uh, San Diego, California, and this thing was not of this world. Now, that's what he stated, and that wasn't some YouTube video. That was Fox News with Tucker Carlson, and Tucker is in Bill O'Reilly's old slot. This is major prime time. This is, this is like keynote, you know, this is the deal, and he's there, and it wasn't like a 30-second interview. It was more like a three- to five-minute interview, and at the end of that, Tucker – went off script and basically said, this is really important. Why aren't we talking about this more? Remember, Tucker Carlson is a talking head. He's brilliant, very smart man, but he's a talking head. His producers feed him information on a teleprompter. They do the research. They book the guests. That's how it's done. Now, is Tucker involved in that? Absolutely. Of course he is. But how much did he know about Fravor's F-18 plane? might not have known anything about it. might have just been on a docket. He may have quickly read it in the green room before taping the show. The bottom line is when, when he was done, the interview with Fravor, uh, that's what he stated. This, is, this seems really important to me. Why aren't we talking about this more? And just last night, he actually interviewed Leslie Keem, uh, former New, New York Times reporter. She's got all the right pedigree. So he gave her the compliment that she's like the, uh, the, the creme de la creme in UFO research, which is – which is true to a degree. But let's not dismiss the rest of us who've been in the trenches for like 30 years, you know, and waving our hands frantically saying the phenomenon is real. So Tucker Carlson interviews Fravor, and it begs the question, where did Fravor get the film? Who 
was acting as a liaison press agent for Fravor. Why now? Why was this on Fox News? Who booked him in there? In other words, what we're looking at is a managed agenda, a managed agenda. You got to pull back the screen and, and go beyond Fravor. Fravor's just part of the dog and pony show that the deep state, because that's who's behind it, in my opinion, the deep state rolled out. Fravor doesn't, you see what's amazing about this, Fravor comes out and he, and he gives this report. But, but Tucker doesn't ask the question, well, well, who are you working for? You know, where did you get the film? He doesn't ask any of the questions that I would ask. Where did you get this film? How were you allowed to use it? Um, who's your press agent and why are you coming out with this now? Uh, he, all the questions, in other words, what's behind this? And it's a managed agenda and it's the deep state. And it's the question is, why are they rolling it out now? Why does Harry Reid feel it necessary to come on the record and tell the American people that there's a secret government program to research and study UFOs? Well, how are you studying them and researching them? Are you back engineering craft or are you just looking at video? And I got a hunch it's a lot more than looking at video because that was already done in Blue Book in the 50s. So what they did is they didn't need Project Blue Book anymore because of all the down craft, in my opinion. There are people who argue with that. But, you know, we've, we've talked to people like Dr. Jesse Marcel Jr., who actually handled the wreckage uh, from, from the Roswell crash site. It was not a weather balloon. His father would have known what a weather balloon looks like. He would have dismissed it instantly. And his father came in and said, see this? You're looking at material that comes from another world. That's what Jesse Marcel Sr. said. Marcel Jr. was about 11, 12 at the time. So to think that Jesse Marcel Sr. Would, would go out of his way to bring a box of weather balloon material to his family is absolute poppycock rubbish nonsense, in my opinion. I interviewed Jesse Marcel Jr., and he, he just said, you know, my father, this whole weather balloon thing has disparaged my father's reputation and, and caused great harm to our family for decades. And the reason for this is his father <laughs> was a brilliant man. He was a head of intelligence at the base at Roswell. He'd seen and handled weather balloons countless times. Are you flipping kidding me? This is a, this is a disgrace, what was done to him. So the wreckage is real, but we want everything by two witnesses. Well, there's more than, than Jesse Marcel Jr. There's other people that have come on the record. I interviewed a couple who interviewed this guy called Colonel Hill. Colonel Hill was OSS, the forward of the CIA. He was an interrogator in World War II. And at the end of life, Jim and Carolyn Raskin came in and uh, helped this man clear out his estate. That's what they did for a living. Carolyn, that's what she does. And in, in the course of two years of working with Colonel Hill, they got to know him very well, very intimately. And basically, to cut to the chase, Hill gave them a deathbed confession. It was a month before he passed away. And when asked, was Roswell a weather balloon? Hill stated emphatically, no, it was not a weather balloon. It was a crash. He was flown from uh, um, Dallas, Fort Worth to Roswell and tried to make contact with one of these entities that were alive. So that's, you know, what are we supposed to do with this stuff? So when they're, when Harry Reid talks about they're studying them, let me get a slurp here. When Harry Reid talks about the, the government is studying UFOs, are they back engineering craft? Are they assembling craft? Are they... Um, collecting DNA from so-called alien life bodies. And we're not told because the reporter doesn't ask the question, which is the question, you know, what are you studying? What is the government studying? This week, there was a uh, article on Drudge Report. Janet Airlines um, is looking for people to as flight attendants on a flight which doesn't exist to an area that doesn't exist, Area 51. The government the third leg of our little journey here, uh, declared, admitted that Area 51 exists. So now we get in Bob Lazar's face. And, you know, Lazar has maintained for decades that he handled a very strange element. They were trying to back engineer what made the craft fly. He saw what he deemed the sports model actually hover in the air. Uh, Gary Schultz was out there in circa 19... 90, 89, 92, something like that, well before the X-Files. I mean, I could go and look at my 
uh, at my at my um, paper because of the picture on the back of the picture he's got it signed and tells us you know where it came from. But anyway, it's around that circa 1990 and well before the X Files, well before anyone knew anything about Area 51. And he would stake this out with other people at a place called the mailbox, which, by the way, you can't get to anymore. Uh, uh, the government brought up additional land. So the place where he was perched looking at the craft, you couldn't get there. And they found out that Wednesday, for whatever reason, was the hot night. Wednesday was the night that they flew the craft. It would come up over the mountains and they would it would hover in the air. It would make right angle turns. Um, all this is people, well, it's experimental aircraft nonsense. Uh, a pilot that we interviewed for our film, uh, in their own words, UFOs are real. The guy's name is Dennis, flying from Lima, Peru to Mexico City. This thing came in at 50,000 miles an hour and paced the aircraft for a good seven minutes. There were these huge beams of light that that Dennis um, believed perhaps had something to do with the propulsion system. And when it left, it left in a blink of an eye. Uh, there were windows he couldn't see in them. I mean, it was it was craft. It was real craft. It wasn't some sort of, you know, uh, illusion. And we've had too many people talk about uh, the craft. So the question is, what are we looking at? Where is this technology from? Who are these entities? What is the cat and mouse game? And I do believe, as Jacques Vallée and J. Allen kind of believe, that these are interdimensional entities. That's what they are. These are interdimensional entities which are nefarious. They have a, a dark agenda. And I've written books about it. I've, I've created videos and films and, 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 and lectured about it incessantly for decades now and continue to do so. And that's why I'm on your show. Yeah, in regards to what you just said about um, <clears throat> ETs being interdimensional, uh, some people have asserted that is the proper way of uh, looking at it. While the ETs, uh, many of the ones that interact with our world, be they malevolent or benevolent, do, can be said to come from other planets and i can name tons of people in the et contact e community who tell which planets which star systems they come from it does when it all comes down to it makes sense to say that they are interdimensional um and uh there's a lot of debate as to what dimension or density some people use the words interchangeably some don't what they actually mean but i do think when it comes down to it um interdimensional is the um proper way of looking at ets regardless of whether or not they do or do not uh come from another planet um, now, in regards to uh, the present day and how much longer we may have to uh, to deal with this, um, and also which ETs are involved and which aren't, um, a lot of controversy about this, um, like the whole idea of the Nephilim, you've talked about that before, and who, what sure. they are and what they aren't. Um, we might as well talk about this now, but well, here's where all the confusion comes in. you got a lot of people that talk about this subject, like Zachariah Sitchin and, and David Icke and Jordan Maxwell and others, and they kind of give different takes on what their interpretation is. And I, based on what I've seen, I don't think any of them are any more particularly wrong or right than the other. It's just that they've looked at it in different ways. Uh, like Zachary Sitchin, for example, he says that the um, terms Anunnaki, Nephilim, and Elohim, they can all be used interchangeably, but that does not mean that all Anunnaki are Nephilim and vice versa, and all Nephilim are Elohim and vice versa. There are different um, categories of different races and different species, for lack of better words, that you can put in each group under each um, classification. Well, uh, this is your time to shine. So based on your um, interpretation, um, what is the difference between Anunnaki, Elohim, um, Nephilim, and um, when it comes to species of races, be they reptilian aliens or the Anunnaki from Nibiru, like Sitchin talks about, what kind of specific races are we uh, talking about here, specifically when we talk about the uh, not just the Anunnaki, Elohim, and Nephilim, but also the control system races that are suppressing our consciousness and trying to keep humanity in check up to the present day. That's that's quite a mouthful. And I mean, we could spend the rest of the of our hour together, you know, talking about that. Let's let's kind of deconstruct. First of all, Sitchin's book, um, you know, Chariot of the Gods, was, was a game changer. That was I mean, von Daniken. Uh, von Daniken. I'm yeah. sorry. I'm sorry. Von Daniken. I mean, that that book that book was a game changer. And you know, Sitchin is no longer with us. And but he did talk about the Sumerian texts, and e even his translations are somewhat suspect by other scholars um, who have waded through his 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 uh, books. And I'm not here to argue that one way or the other. But I'll say this: 
getting back to Von Daniken, which, you know, they're sort of, they were contemporaries in, 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 in a way. Uh, Von Daniken's book, Chariots of the Gods, basically saying the same thing. We've been visited. It, it's the basis for ancient aliens, um, ancient astronauts. I get that. We all agree that something's going on. There's a hidden history in this planet, on this planet, that, that we don't know, that's been in some ways deliberately obfuscated. Uh, in other ways, um, it's, it's a managed agenda by the powers that be to keep this information hidden. And they do, the powers that be, the elites, do their best. Um, these entities have been around for, for millennia and continue to do so. Uh, the Nephilim, in my opinion, and for, based on my mentor, Dr. I.D.E. Thomas, and the countless books I've read on it, the Nephilim, according to the biblical record, are the, are the offspring of fallen angels and the women of earth. That's what the Nephilim are. They are, in my opinion, soulless. They're in a fixed state. They do not have souls. And yet they're there and they're running around. They, some of them were very, very large, giants over 12 feet tall. And the first incursion before the flood, they could have been 20, 25 feet tall. We don't know. They're all wiped out in the flood. And then afterwards, there's a, a second, third, fourth, fifth, you know, ad nauseum incursion up to the present day. And then it changes. And then we and this is why I tie it into the abduction phenomenon. But I'm I, I'm I'm digressing here and I'll wait before I I'm jumping ahead of myself here. So the Nephilim is a hybrid entity. It's a hybrid fallen angel and the women of Earth. Now, if I say the moment I say fallen angel, most people, a lot of your listeners will just immediately click the switch off in their head. If I call that entity a nefarious interdimensional entity. If I if I term it that way, a nefarious interdimensional entity, you'll listen to me all day long because it's a term that you can accept. So now we're into the semantics. But if I say fallen angel, a lot of people went to the church when they were young and they have this false idea of what angels are. Angels comes from the Greek word angelos, which just means messenger. And there are good ones and there's really incredibly nefarious ones. So what the Nephilim are is a byproduct of nefarious interdimensional entities mating with the women of Earth, creating a hybrid being known as the Nephilim. There's a reason for this, which is a three hour conversation. They inhabited the Earth. They're the reason for the flood of Noah. They are the reason. And what's going on here is there's contamination of the human genome. And we see this over and over and over and over again. In fact, there's an ancient prophecy that goes back about 2,000 years, which says that when I return, speaking of Yeshua, when I return, it will be like the days of Noah, which, in my opinion, begs the question, what differentiates the days of Noah? Well, there are several things. The lifespan was greatly elongated in the days of Noah. People live five, six, eight hundred years uh, before they would die. That's one thing. But the other thing, the other dynamic was the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards when the sons of God saw the daughters of men and cohabited with them. So the Anunnaki, in my opinion, right? The Anunnaki are, in fact, another word for these nefarious interdimensional entities. They are written from another culture who describe them as such. And they have this whole mythos which, which go along with that. But that's who I think the Anunnaki are. Then we've got the Elohim, which, you know, Elohim, again, is a biblical term. And from Zechariah, uh, Sister's point of view, you know, the Elohim are, are sort of the over gods of this whole deal. Well, isn't that interesting? I mean, it's, it's a very similar, a very similar mythos, as it were. When you go into Greek mythos and you read about minotaurs and senators, when you read about the gods and Hercules and, and, and all these, all these ancient gods of Greece, I think there's a linguistic tie-in, not only linguistically, but I think they're talking about essentially the Titans, uh, which can be traced back into the fallen angels. And we see this over and over and over again. Uh, these ancient entities want to be worshipped and they set up shop all over the earth. In fact, I'm working on a book about this. When you go to Teotihuacan in Mexico, very large pyramid, the base of which is greater and larger than the Pyramid of Cheops. Now, I've been to that site. I had dysentery. Uh, I wasn't feeling good. I was 40 pounds overweight. 
completely out of shape. I was at 5,000 feet and had altitude sickness. So strike three, I'm hosed. I got up to the first level and I really didn't appreciate the sight until I got home and I my head cleared and I felt better. And then I started looking at my pictures and I just, and then the light bulb went off. Where does the technology that created a TOT Wakan come from? Where does the engineering, the mathematics, the, the, the building skills, where does it all come from? Who's designing this thing? And you got to remember, there is no pre-culture that's playing around with a pyramidal shape like Teotihuacan. This thing just, boom, hello, we're here, and there it is. When you go to Corral in Peru, you see the same thing. Corral is about three hours outside of Lima. Ancient city, the oldest city in all the Americas. Been there twice. Pyramids. And, of course, you can only go to certain places. It's just amazing how all these sites are controlled. Why can't I climb at the top of this pyramid? It looks like there's an altar there. No, you can't go there. Why can't I take pictures and go down into this into this like area? Why can't? Well, you can't go there. So you know that's why you, you got to go. It, it just takes time to hook up with Peruvian archaeologists who can open the doors and get you in, get me in to some of these places. But Corral, it's the same thing. There is no pre-existing culture, and we see advanced mathematics. We see a knowledge of the solar system, of the way the planets work, of the winter and summer solstice, of the equinoxes, the lunar progression. It's all there. And where does that come from? If there's no pre-existing culture, where does all this knowledge, where does this huge knowledge dump? How does it happen? And, and wherever you go, you see the same thing. And it's, and it's global. It's not only in the Americas. It's in Stonehenge, England. Where, do, where does the knowledge for that come from? How did they move the stones? Just show me. Um, how did they to create this? It's just amazing. But then you go to places like the Great Circle Mound in Ohio. I've been to Stonehenge, England. It was fascinating. Years and years ago. And I'll get back there again, hopefully, maybe this year, because I want to see it again. But the Great Circle Mound in Ohio, in Newark, Ohio, which I've been to numerous times and lectured there, it is a leveled, first of all, it's a circle, it's a hinge. There's a, there's a moat inside the circle. And at the entrance of the, of the circle, uh, some people estimate that it was, they were serpent heads that were 20 feet tall. Uh, most of the, the hinge, the mounds are 8 to 12, 15 feet tall, depends where you are. But inside that 1200 foot circle is a plaza which is pretty much dead level because when the moat would fill up in order to have the moat fill up, you'd have to make that level begs the question. How do you do that in antiquity? Archaeologists will tell us that native Americans took birch bark baskets or deer hide baskets and, and flint hose and dug the earth and moved one basket at a time to the mound, and it took several hundred years to build it. But they never tell you, well, how many hoes did you actually find on the site? We were just down at this, another site along the Mississippi, again, attributed to these enigmatic people called the Mound Builders. And the Mound Builders built Cahokia, supposedly, and this other place called Poverty Point. Poverty Point is the second largest earthen pyramid in the United States, Cahokia being the first. Uh, Poverty Point's pyramidal complex, pyramidal mound, 390,000 tons of earth. When I asked the archaeologist, well, how did they move the dirt and how many hoe handles, how many hoes have you found? He says, oh, about 25. So let me get this straight. 390,000 tons of earth and you only find 25 um, flint hoes? Something's wrong with this picture. Something's really wrong with this picture. And how do you compact the earth and shape it so it doesn't wash away? And they, there are no answers to any of this. And so what we've done, my team, we've got an anthropologist, Rick Woodward, and we had a flint napper make a replica of the hoe. And when the, when the ground thaws back at, around Poverty Point, Rick's going to take the hoe, we're going to film all this, and we're going to see how long we can use this hoe until it breaks. Is it one hour? Is it eight hours? Is it two days? 
and you know we're gonna we're gonna have different people use the hoe and then you know take the dirt and put it in the basket and dump it 20 feet away which is it's actually a lot longer than that from this digging site to where these pyramids are but we'll make it easy and we'll see just how long and how um how long before the hoe breaks is it going to be an hour or two days but it, my point is this if the hoe breaks quickly then you guys got to rethink your theory because it's not going to fly. And the plaza at Cahokia, which is 45 acres, is dead level within two inches. Now, you can do that in modernity with earth movers and bulldozers. How do you do that in antiquity? How do you do that 800 or 1,000 or 2,000 years? And people have different dates on this. You know, how do you build the Great Serpent, Serpent Mound uh, or the Great Circle Mound in Ohio, which I was just talking about, 1,200 feet in diameter? How do you level that plaza so the moat will fill? You know, I mean, these are questions that modern archaeologists really don't have any news for, any answers for, in my opinion. They just don't. And so they make it up because they have to be inside the confines of a non-supernatural world. And they have to stay in the confines not only of a non-supernatural world, but any otherworldly interference. So that's the Darwinian paradigm, and that really holds a lot of research in what I would call an intellectual prison, because people are not allowed to think outside the box. Another example of this would be the Berinzian land bridge. So we're told, uh, archaeologists, the Darwinian theory, that after the last ice age, as, as things began to recede, there was this land bridge that connected Asia to Alaska, now called the Bering Strait. So the Beringian land bridge was an operation, and people trucked over from Asia looking for game and, and a different place to live, yada, 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 and came down uh, through North America and, and, and fanned out and settled the Americas. And that's true. I'll admit that. That did happen. But that's not the only people who came over here. And this is the basis of our ongoing research with the elongated Paracas skulls. And I got to just announce this because I'm on your show, but on February 2nd, we will be conducting a formal press conference um, uh, at the Marriott Hotel in Los Angeles. Uh, I will be speaking, Brian Forrester, Marcia Moore, who's a 3D forensic artist, Richard Shaw, who's a filmmaker, will be presenting a short film on the enigmatic elongated skulls. Dr. Michael Alde, medical doctor, will weigh in uh, on the genetic differences. Mondo Gonzalez, our archaeologist, will be presenting our DNA evidence. Chase Klotsky was our forensic expert. She will be presenting how we collected the material. Dr. Malcolm Warren is a chiropractor, and he'll be talking about the because of the morphological differences in these elongated skulls, uh, we might be looking at something completely different. And of course, Rick Woodward is our anthropologist who um, came up with some extremely interesting um, uh, discoveries on these skulls. And that our team, all of it will be uh, will be presenting the room. We upgraded the room. We Originally, we could only hold 75 people. We're now in the Meridian room. We can hold 250 people. Seats will go extremely quickly. We also are live streaming the event. More about that soon. And we are charging for the live streaming because... Uh, this press conference is going to set back our funding about 20 grand. We've been on the trail for five years. This is hardcore science. It's DNA evidence. We will be presenting all this. We think it's groundbreaking, and we think it's time to tell whoever wants to hear it, our peer, peer review, whatever, the scientific community, what we have found, the data. This is the data that we have. This is what we're going with. We're not saying these are of a Nephilim. We don't know what they are, but we find them incredibly enigmatic and mysterious, and that's why we're on the trail. And so those people who sign up for live streaming, that money will go right back into our on the trail DNA account. We'll be used for further research and keep keep our coffers full, as it were. So, you know, we're on the trail. We're actually doing hard scientific evidence, and we will be presenting a DNA at the Marriott. It's Friday, February 2nd, 2018, between 1 and 5 at the Marriott Los Angeles Airport. Um, it's up on the blog. It'll be up on the uh, on the site and more details very soon about the live streaming. Wish you the best of luck with that. Um, <clears throat> wish I could go to that, but uh, well, for, I will be in Los Angeles for the Conscious Life Expo and 
well, can't really travel too much because my horoscope uh, told me try to avoid unnecessary travel this year. But uh, well, I, that's just another thing. Uh, well, that half hour flew by pretty quickly. So uh, we could spend a lot of time on these things, but I'd like to talk about some other stuff. And uh, one of the controversial things I heard you say um, in your um, – uh, the second talk I listened to about how um, you were talking about David Icke and his research, and you see it said that you uh, there are some things that David Icke says about Christianity that you um, do not agree with. Well, David Icke, in a nutshell, his take on religion is, uh, hey, it's your prerogative to take a religion. The founding fathers understood everybody has their own prerogative, and that's why they put the uh, right to freedom of religion in the First Amendment. But that doesn't change the fact that it's not in your best interest to take up a religion because the only thing, according to David Icke, religions are good for, well, for the most part – is suppressing your consciousness because religions teach you to worship some sort of a higher power when you yourself are infinite consciousness, which implies that you yourself are God. <laughs> so there's really no sense in um, uh, rooting and cheering and uh, worshiping some sort of higher power up there because, well, you, you might as well uh, acknowledge that God is infinite consciousness and, uh, well, the double slit experiment and the mathematics behind the Mandelbrot set are two of the more prominent things that people use uh, to show that and the uh, evidence for that. But um, you seem to think there's a few things David Icke has wrong about his interpretation of Christianity and maybe some other religions. So could you perhaps clarify um, what you meant by that when you said you disagree with him and some of his followers? Well, I mean, no, no disrespect to David Icke. I mean, people can believe what they want to believe and that, and that's fine. Um, let me tell you a little bit about, my background before I jump into Ike and why I'm qualified to deal with some of this. Um, I'm 67 years old. When I was 13, uh, I got in, I left the Catholic Church. I was born and raised and, you know, raised up in the Catholic Church. And at 13 years old, I, I abandoned um, the Catholic faith. The Beatles were uh, totally into, this is 1963, 64. They were totally into Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. They had gone to India. They had come back. All things Eastern mysticism, there was a flood of occult and Eastern mystical um, literature which came in. I read everything. And again, you know, Von Daniken's book was a life changer for me. Um, that was just an amazing book. And I agree with him. Something's going on here. And I mean, I've written my own books about places like Sac Sewaman and, and other places, the same places that Von Daniken went. But I have a different take than he does, but I digress. So I was um, very into... Carlos Castaneda's books, uh, teachings of Don Juan, looking, you know, evacuated knowledge, trying to open up the uh, my chakra centers. Uh, my third eye was open. I was a follower of a guru. I did silver mind control. I had what you can only call spirit guides. Um, I had out of body experiences, i.e., astral projection. So I've been around. I've been around for a while in in that in that world. So when I'm talking about Christianity now, I can I can go back to what I experienced before I became a Christian. My feet have been in both camps. I've been in the New Age, higher consciousness, third eye open, spirit guide, the whole deal. Um, you know, this nebulous higher consciousness thing, feel the force, Luke, been there, done that. But 37 years ago, something happened which changed. And and the first thing that people need to understand is, the, and this is this is eventually David Icke will, will come to the end of himself because everyone does at some point. And what I mean by that, when it gets close to the end, is when people really who haven't who have wrestled with this and denied it all their lives, that's when it starts to change, because when a person realizes that I'm in the process of dying, and there's a lot of different you know, modalities, people can look at that and I'm going to blend into the great unknown. There is nothing afterwards, whatever. Whatever your paradigm or your belief system is, uh, like Buddhism, I'm just going to go back to this this consciousness, which, you know, I'll be just assimilated into it. So, and I've always found that disturbing. But what we have here, the only system, the only system on this planet that I've ever found that and this will, people will start squirming when I say this because you'll get very uncomfortable. Everybody always does. The only system that deals with man's depravity, the only system is Christianity. And it basically says that humankind is, de is deprived, 
is, is depraved, not deprived, excuse me, depraved. And people have a hard time with that. And I just point them to the six o'clock news and, and, and the Holocaust and what Pol Pot did and what Idi Amin did and what's happening right now in Syria and the murder rate in Baltimore and the murder rate in Chicago and, and the, the one billion abortions on the planet. And I could sit here the rest of the afternoon and talk about this because that's the depravity of humankind. So the first thing that, that people need to do is come to the point, and I'm not saying we're you know depraved madmen. I'm not saying that. But we lie and we cheat and we yell and we scream and we cheat on our wives. Some of us do. And, you know, some of us go and, and, and murder uh, and, and that. Some of us become drug addicts. I mean, the whole the whole thing of a drug addict coming clean is they finally come at the end of themselves and they go, I need a higher power here because I have no control over this. And they go, hey, if you're out there, you know, change me. I get it. And all of a sudden something happens and they change. And that's kind of what we're talking about. That's what happened to me 37 years ago. I wasn't a drug addict. I was a seeker, but I had had it. I had lived in an ashram. I had given my life to the guru. I meditated every day. My third eye was open. I mean, I saw light, tasted nectar, heard uh, divine music, all this nonsense. But it never changed the inner me. It never changed or did anything with who I was. Now, you can call it sin nature. You can call it the depravity of man. Call it whatever you want. I don't care. But it never dealt with that. And the whole point of Christianity is there is a way to deal with that. And it's been set in motion. There's there's countless prophecies which talk about it before the event and after the event. So this is nothing that's like, and I'm not talking church here per se. I'm talking about ancient prophetic texts which talk about this is this is what's going to happen. The event happens. And then guess what? There's more to it and it's coming back. But that's a three hour conversation. And it's a very deep conversation. And so, you know, I, I'm going to predict something that at some point, you know, David Icke, maybe, hopefully he will. He'll start looking around and, and scratching his head and going, you know, what what is consciousness really? And no one knows. No one has an answer to that. I mean, how do how do you hear? How, how, what is verbiage? Well, is hold on. I got, let me interrupt you. Consciousness sure. is the awareness of being aware. Simple as that. Do you agree or disagree with that definition? I, I agree with that, but wh where does it come from? That's that's what I'm saying. Where where does how did all this begin? You know why why are you conscious? Why am I conscious? Why are we aware? It's like whoa, where are we? Here's something to think about. And I've been saying this all year long at at conferences. If we are intellectually honest, no one no one on this planet has any idea what this is, the universe, and how we got here. Nobody has any idea. Are we in if, if the universe is analogous to America, are we in Walla Walla, Tampa, you know, Cape Cod, Los Angeles? No one knows. We have no idea what is is it a hologram? Are we inside a kind of a matrix? I think we're in some kind of a matrix. I really do. Because when these these entities come in, the nefarious ones and the good ones, they they can manipulate time, space, matter, and energy. And we see this over and over and over again in ways that defy our physics. So something's going on here. We all we all agree on that. But no one really knows. And and I don't I certainly don't have an answer to this. You know, where where am I residing right now? <laughs> if I if I could just say that kind of tongue in cheek. I mean, I'm in this shell, but where where am I really residing and how how do I actually interface with this little machine I'm in? And I have no flicking idea how this I said flick. No flicking idea. <laughs> Absolutely, Captain. I mean, how that works, nor does anybody else. And I find that astounding. So I, I'm like a little kid that looks around in absolute awe and wonder and scratch my head and go, you know, where am I really? What is this? And I go back to the anchor of the biblical prophetic narrative that seems for me anyway to make the most sense. Okay, thank you very much. And we'll talk about now the uh, let's talk about some end time stuff relating to biblical prophecy. There was a lot of talk about this um, <clears throat> last year in uh, sometime in September, where there was um, something yeah. in the Book of Revelation talking about about how that suggested the constellation of Virgo was going to like 
give birth to Jupiter. Well, that's kind of what was interpreted to happen in the cosmos from someone observing the stars. And there claimed to be um, something in the book of Revelation that was uh, was talking about that um, someday in uh, September. Can't seem to remember what day it the 23rd yeah okay i guess so so um that uh d were people just um connecting the dots in something that was just appeared to be a book of revelation prophecy in real life but they just well were like, making much ado about nothing it's just a just a coincidence that that's the way the stars aligned in the book of revelation said that well others would say well no there's no such thing as a true coincidence everything happening is for a reason but uh it's just that they were treating it as more than they probably should be so uh what what's your take on that specific event and when you talk about the end times people usually refer to that as a, a doomsday scenario but in reality other people assert no it just means the end times of the way of life as we know it which could is probably going to be a good thing and many would assert has to be a good thing because well allegedly the archive control system has been cannibalizing itself since 2011 um, and has to keep cannibalizing itself to, to sustain itself. So it's unavoidable that we'll attain higher <laughs> consciousness and the end times will, um, the end of days or whatever you want to call it, will actually be uh, a good thing and will feel very comfortable and joyous and not a not like a doomsday apocalypse as some predicted. So uh, it, what, it, what's your it, take it, on this? Yeah, well, let me let me back up first of all. as As a Christian, as a pastor, as a researcher, been doing it for 37 years. Uh, people don't understand what the bat what the Battle of Armageddon is and what what the apocalypse are. We are looking at a very nefarious entity, which first of all and his and his cohorts are thrown down from another dimension. And they and it says, "Woe to the inhabitants of Earth, because the the devil, the dragon, Satan, has uh, come down to you, and he knows his time is short." And we could talk the rest rest of the whole you know hour just on that. But let me. So the apocalypse is a battle between the rider on the white horse and the dragon. So this is Revelation 12. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars. The woman is Israel. That's the woman. The 12 stars are the 12 tribes of Judah. She was pregnant and cried out in pain and was about to give birth. Another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads, ten horns, and seven crowns on its head. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky. When the dragon rebelled against, um, I'll just use the word, the Elohim, okay? Because uh, that's what, that's user-friendly. When the dragon rebelled, he swept a third of the stars out of the sky. A third of the so-called angelic host followed him. Another three-hour conversation. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, that's the Messiah, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. Right there, rule all the nations with an iron scepter, three-hour conversation. And her child was snatched up to God into his throne. That happened 2,000 years ago. The woman fled into the wilderness. Now it's prophetic. Now it's prophetic. Now it moves into the future. We're not here yet. The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. That's the back end of the tribulation period. Now listen to this. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael, the good guys, and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. I call this the great eviction notice. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. Look, I, you know, when I read that, my mind reels. Because this is another dimension, and something's going on. Now get this next line. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. That is incredible. That is incredible. And that is literal in my opinion. And when it happens, all hell breaks loose on the planet. And that is apocalyptic. The good news is when we go to Revelation 19, the rider on the white horse shows up. And that's the game changer. That's, that's what I'm waiting for, the rider on the white horse. And, you know, for people who aren't schooled in this, it sounds it sounds like a Lord of the Rings fantasy book. I mean, in some ways. I mean, it really does. It's just like, you got to be kidding, L.A. Do you really believe in this stuff? All I know is that the supernatural is more real than the natural world. And the prophetic thread, which goes from Genesis to Revelation, is 100% accurate 100% of the time. So what I just talked about is future. Revelation 12 sign um, 
was in the past. In the past. But it's it's also dual meaning. What's happened in, in antiquity is about to happen again during this period of time when the dragon is finally thrown down. Make sense? Well, it's, uh, for me, it does, <laughs> but it depends. Uh, I get, there's so many different uh, points of view on this um, that, that people can offer that uh, I don't really know if I should be speaking on behalf of anyone else. But to me, well, I don't see how it would make any more or less sense than it currently does. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, you said it, couldn't have said it better. I think you uh, said it pretty well. So, uh, well, that, that that's good. And, uh, well, uh, since we're talking a little about religion, I want to... Um, talk about maybe what the future of it has in store because the whole thing about Pluto and Capricorn right now with the astrologically speaking signaling the destruction of everything that's not in humanity's best interest I have heard from a couple sources that certain things will collapse more than others um, up until 2024 recently uh, Brad Johnson who channels uh, Adronis uh, while he was channeling Adronis said that like by the year 2024 um, everything Illuminati control system based will be for all intents and purposes, gone. <laughs> I mean, it's going away bit by bit, but it should be gone by 2024. And uh, one of the last things, the last things that we should see the end of would be world religions. A lot of people that follow religion are going to be upset about this, but I would have to think that in a sense, it would kind of make sense that out of all the things in humanity that kind of are an obstacle to our expanding consciousness, it would seem that religion would be the one thing people would want to hold on dearly to but maybe over the course of time just like whistleblowers come out with a lot of revelations so too will people come out with like lost texts and such where that say hey uh religions were mostly not entirely but mostly created by forces that did not have humanity's best interest at heart so you would all be wise to give up your religions and acknowledge your all infinite consciousness and all and that will be as some say one of the last things that we'll see the end of uh, during this whole Pluto in the Capricorn cycle. Do you see that playing out? And in general, up until the end of the Pluto Capricorn cycle in 2024, how do you see the um, uh, the destruction of things that are, don't stand in humanity's best interest playing out? And is there anything specifically in the Book of Revelation, or any other religious text for that matter, that pinpoint to this being a genuine occurrence? I think we're in a window of time where we're, we're already seeing things. I mean, like we talked about in the beginning of the show, was disclosure. Here's something to think about. And OK, I don't I don't I'm not familiar with the gentleman who was channeling the entity and I'm not familiar with with the entity. How can this gentleman or how can anyone ascertain whether this entity is benevolent or malevolent? What's the litmus test? What's the litmus test? Well, you'd have to ask him, but I did. What but I there is no, there is no litmus yeah. test. And that's the problem. He's going to assume, just like when I interviewed Blossom Goodchild, that this entity is benevolent. How do they know that? Channeling, you are picking up a spirit from another dimension. There's no doubt about that. And in my opinion, once again, the guidebook of the supernatural tells us and, and, and warns us of just such thing, that we're not equipped to deal with these entities. Therefore, do not open yourself up to channeled information. These entities, as Jacques Vallée would say, and other other experiencers of UFO phenomena, would, would also tell us that they have they are, they habitually lie. They do it all the time. That's sort of their calling card. So when I hear stuff like this, channeled information, which you know I've been tracking and following for years, how does it fit in the Book of Revelation? Well, again, we have prophecy that two thousand years that tell us that in the latter days, no one will be able to buy, sell, or trade without this, this mark. Peggy, can you come down and let wrinkles out, please? <laughs> dog driving you crazy. Uh, it's just, I yeah, just ignored got, it. You tell Love Live Radio, right? Let the dogs out. Who let the dogs out? So there he goes. Hi, Mr. Wrinkles. Stay tuned for the Mr. Wrinkles show, folks. Anyway, um, we have to ask ourselves, this prophecy written 2,000 years ago, um, which with and, and, and talks about with great specificity that no one will be able to buy, sell or trade without this this enigmatic mark of the beast. Well, you know, you go back 150 years ago and people would go, well, that's that's impossible. That'll never happen. I mean, that's that's got to be fantasy. That's got to be it just shows you that the Bible's a wacky book. 
Now we're in, you know, 2018 where people are getting shipped, where we all have credit cards and those credit cards can I can stick them in a little goofy machine in Peru and it spits out funny money. How's that work? All the way down there. I can I can punch those numbers in wherever I go on this planet for the most part and I can buy, sell or trade right now. But there's something coming which will be used to enslave the entire earth, according to the biblical prophetic narrative. And that is the mark of the beast. And in our research, Richard Shaw and I, with our Watchers series, when we took out that implant, which uh, was in Watchers 7 and Watchers 8, when we actually took out this implant, a guy who had been taken when he's five years old, he's now 45 years old, we took out the implant, had been in there for 40 years, um, we believe that that is the mark of the beast. That's the prototype to the mark of the beast. Whoever's doing this has spent an awful lot of time taking people and putting, inserting these implants. And they, they're very, extremely sophisticated. Um, some have posited that there were double-walled nanotubes found in these things. They apparently integrate with a human being's nervous system. Very complex, very complex. And I don't pretend to know what they are and how they, are, how they work. I only know that when we took it, we tried to take it out, the thing was switched off. We couldn't find it. It was like it was cloaked. And then I prayed, and, and like a minute and a half later, bam, it came up on the on the monitor. And Dr. Roger Lear was taken aback by that whole episode. And he came up to me on Monday. We just, we did this on a Saturday. He came up to me and said, L.A., last time I ever saw him alive. He said, L.A., I now believe it's a supernatural component to the UFO phenomenon, and I'm going to tell Whitley Strieber about it. Whether he ever got to Whitley, I don't know. But what happened in that operating theater it changed his paradigm. It shook him to the core because something happened there. He, everyone saw it. You know, everybody saw what happened. We couldn't find the implant for an hour and 20 minutes. An hour and 20 minutes. We had found it two weeks earlier on the pre-op in like less than two minutes. It was there. And I prayed. And it was no long-winded prayer. I just said, Father, if there are forces cloaking this device, I pray that you would break your power and do it soon. You know, that's nothing religious about that, right? I mean, you know, it's just a, there is a re little request. And less than an hour, and less than two minutes later, this thing, this the implant, the image of the implant comes up on the monitor out of nowhere, and everybody goes, "Oh my gosh, what's that?" Matriciani, Dr. Matriciani, is like looking at the ultrasound wand, tapping it, and putting it on and off, on and off, on and off. He can't believe he's trying to figure out why are we seeing it now? I've been over this little strip of flesh for the last hour and twenty minutes. Why am I seeing it now? And it was right where the X was. He knew where it was based on the X-ray. So that's high strangeness, as you know, as, as J.L. Hank would say, that that's high strangeness. And I think I know what happened there. But I think these implants are, in fact, the mark of the beast. Yes, uh, the whole idea of a microchip global population is the ultimate goal of the um the powers that be and uh well one a person david i spoke to said uh, if you say no to one thing say no to the microchip because if you get microchipped uh, free will is gone but uh, yeah you're, right. you're host and there's another thing from the biblical prophetic narrative again this is the dress with great specificity that anyone who takes this mark anybody who takes this mark winds up in a very nasty place there's there's no chance of redemption at all on any level. And you've got to scratch your head and you've got to go, what is going on here? And this gets back into my research with the Nephilim. Because the only time we see this kind of judgment meted out is when the Nephilim are on the earth. So it's a very, very complex mix. It's It's very strange. And I think it's playing out. I really do. I think it's playing out. I think we're going to see more disclosure in 2018. Heck, it hasn't stopped. I mean, Tucker Carlson had Leslie Keen on last night, you know, talking about the whole UFO phenomenon. I mean, wh how do we deal with that? And what, a couple of weeks earlier, he had Fravor on, the F-18 pilot. And, and think, of, we talked about this, so I, I'm not going to reiterate it, but, but, but why is that tried it out? Why is that dog and pony show tried it out? Why now? And then the follow-up, it's like every couple of days, another, you know, another little story emerges. And most Americans aren't awake. Most Americans are asleep. And most most of the world is asleep. And so they don't they're not tracking with it. And we've already crossed that line. And all it's going to do is it'd be very interesting to, to see what they reveal in 2018. Really interesting. Right. Um, one thing that's going on in the present day that's um, 
cause for a lot of uh, concern is the whole um, intermingling that's been done with um, opening the borders of countries up and uh, bringing um, Islamic refugees into the countries. Right. And um, I mean, this has caused a lot of people to unfortunately um, take up uh, Islamophobia, but one might say, well, is it reasonable to have that? I mean, when you look at all, um, I, I don't mean to pick on any specific religion more than the other, but hey, the fact is, every religion has its own unique way of suppressing consciousness, and um, when it comes to the Islamic religion, that religion seems to be notorious for suppre well, a, suppressing the divine feminine, as evidenced by the fact that women have to conceal their, their appearance in public and put um, clothing all over themselves to hide their faces and all that, and and um, the idea that, uh, well, it's been said that the Quran, compared to other religious texts, seems to have more contradictions than other religions. Every uh, religion has contradictions, but if you look at the Quran closely, I have heard, uh, this is what some allege, it has the most contradictions. And that, in a sense, is the crux of uh, why Muslims may be prone to being more terrorist-like than other people because the text that they're studying is filled with contradictions and that screws with their mind and makes them think, okay, is it okay for me to be a terrorist? But then it's not okay for me to be a terrorist. And well, if you can't make up your mind, you're likely to be a danger to society. So uh, um, no offense to Muslims, but do you uh, actually think that, yeah, this is kind of uh, not the way things uh, should be going. There has to be a better way of uh, like handling all these refugees and all than to just let them come into a country um, the way that it's going now, and what solutions do you potentially see for this um, this problem that we're seeing in the present day? Well, I mean, I, I, I blog about this, I've written about this. This is calculated, this is deliberate. The powers that be are attempting, remember, out of chaos order, and that's exactly what they're doing. Um, they know that if they bring these people in, they, chaos will ensue. It's exactly what's going on. There are now no-go zones in France, all throughout Europe, all throughout England, um, No-go zones. I mean, that's what's going on. You can't bring people who are illiterate into and, and have, have completely at odds with Western democracy, democratic ideas. Um, there, there, the ideologies between the two are at loggerheads. They are diametrically opposed with one another. Which is why, you know, when you look where Islam is entrenched, look at the way the people live compared to the democracy, which is basically. And you can say what you want about this. The, the, we enjoy the freedoms that we enjoy in this country. And the Declaration, which is, you know, of independence in our Constitution, the springboard for that is the Protestant Reformation. Now, people can tap dance around that all they want. Do, you know, check it out. Do your history. Spend some time. That's where it's from. That's where that's that's the springboard to the freedoms that we enjoy in America, which, by the way, no other country enjoys, not like we do today. And, of course, it, the, all these freedoms are now under attack. If we were really in a war with terror, you know, W gets up and he goes, you're either with us or you're with the terrorist. And, you know, this whole thing, and it's just all grandstanding and everybody applauds and, yeah, you know, terrorism, one of them we send and we start the Afghan war, 17 years, trillion dollar a year, opium harvest, you know, nonsense. If we want to stop terrorism, and I've written about this, it's a real simple plan. It's a really simple plan. And I'm a simple man, as Bill O'Reilly would say. I'm a simple guy. Simple plan. When the jihadi strikes, if there's one jihadi, let's just go with one jihadi. So if a jihadi strikes... Let's say he's killed in the act of killing 40 or 50 people, all right, with a, with a truck or whatever, whatever means, AK-47, whatever, whatever the deal is. Of course, the left stands up and immediately calls for gun control, and and and, and says, tells us not to be not to be aware, not to be Islamophobic, and never mind the victims. But I digress. So the first thing we do, we round up a jihadi family. They are all charged as war criminals. They are all deemed complicit until proven otherwise. So I realize that's, you know, instead of the assumption of innocence, we're switching that. They are tried as war criminals. They are treated as war criminals. If they're not complicit, that's fine. But they are deported back to their country of origin. If they own a house, that house is sold. The money is given to the victim's families. Then we go after the imam, the mosque. If the, and the and same thing, the imam is treated as a war criminal. If it's found that he's complicit in, in any way, then he's tried as a war criminal. The mosque is sold. The proceeds are given back to the uh, to the victims' families. If he is not complicit in any way, the fact that the jihadi spent time in that mosque, the mosque is closed down anyway. The proceeds are sold and given to the mosque is sold. The grounds are sold and given to the victims' families. Then the imam is deported back to his country of origin. Then the government sanctions the country of origin. It's the only way. 
you're going to stop the jihad. You've got to get tough and you've got to say, look, we're not taking this anymore. You want to shoot us up? That's fine. But we're going to deport your people. We're going to close down the mosque and we're going to sanction your country. And the first time, this is how we're going to sanction your country. So if the jihadi comes from Yemen, we're going to go this, this, this and this the first time. The second time it happens, we're going to do this, this, this and this. So all of a sudden, people are being deported, mosques are being closed. That's how you fight terror. And these guys get up there and like in France, well, you're going to have to get used to this. I mean, this is why my father and other people of his ilk in World War II, you know, flew over there and died on the, on the, on the beaches of Normandy to free this kind of mindset that won't stand up and go, no, we're not going to get used to this type of nonsense. We're going to push back. And I think fair-minded Americans realize that not every Muslim has this, um, you know, has this ideology, but too many of them do. And there was another imam in Texas just over the weekend again, you know, kill, calling for the killing of Jews. There's a clip I show from this, this very fiery imam. His name is Safwa Ghazi. It happened when when uh, Mubarak was, was put down. Morsi was running for the president. Morsi was elected. And Safwa Ghazi stands up and is yelling and screaming in Tahrir Square. And there's like might be a million people there. Who knows? In Egypt. And he's saying the the capital of a newly formed is uh, uh, United Arab States. This is the Muslim Brotherhood. The capital of the United Arab States will not be Mecca or Medina. It will not be Cairo. It will be Jerusalem. And then they, the, the crowd chants in unison to Jerusalem. We go martyrs in the millions. You won't see that on the six o'clock news. And then the the guy goes, uh, say say the word, and, he, and they all yell, Allahu Akbar. So that's not shown on the 6 o'clock news. If American people saw that rally in Tahrir Square from the Muslim Brotherhood, things would be different. But the media doesn't do its job. Instead, we know every little nuance about Bruce Jenner's sex change, but we know nothing of what really matters. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And... Uh... Well, we've already got an hour, but I just want one more question uh, to close this out. Um, okay. What's your uh, – the whole idea about disclosure happening and when it is going to happen. Well, what is disclosure? I mean, if we're talking about um, what's been revealed on um, like sites like YouTube and Vimeo, then disclosures happen because the evidence is out there. The problem, unfortunately, is that um, many – because humanity is so asleep and because humanity is so – a paradigmatic and such, um, the only way for disclosure to be recognized as official is if the government and or mainstream media acknowledges it and also the uh, ETs uh, say, uh, yeah, we're here, we're showing ourselves the ancient astronaut theorists and the UFO notes were right all along and you have no choice but to acknowledge that because, uh, well, here we are and we're showing it. Well, when is that going to happen? Well, unfortunately, it's not going to be for a while. Um, that ET content I mentioned earlier, Brad Johnson, when he was channeling Adronis, uh, Adronis said, based on the probability of the way things are now and how things are consciousness is rising and all that uh full-blown disclosure of the kind where i said where the government and or mainstream media will acknowledge it and the ets will show themselves that will not be until uh you're probably going to do a double face bomb after i say this 2050 yeah i did a double face bomb after i heard that and i was like why I, I mean i'm going through all this trouble to do shows like the one i'm doing with you now all this stuff has been exposed and yet just because the government mainstream media won't acknowledge it and just because the ETs believe that humanity isn't ready because there's going to be chaos in the streets and Orson Welles' War of the Worlds radio broadcast all over again, if we if we show ourselves that's what's going to be happening, it's going to be much worse than that, we can't do that. So am I supposed to, like, want to put my hand around my fellow humans and say, wake up out of your trance, this is this has gone far enough, or do I have to think, hey, this is just the way it is, uh, we have to accept this, or do we, I guess the best, most important question here is, is there any hope of maybe having disclosure happen sooner than 2050 of the kind I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, I, I absolutely think that we're, we're in the midst of the disclosure. It's, it's being rolled out. Like I said earlier, the F-15, F-18 fighter pilot. How, how does that happen? Why does Harry, why does Harry Reid talk about it? Why, does, why all of a sudden is, is Janet Airlines on the Drudge Report? They are rolling it out. And I think this 2018, we're going to see something that's going to blow people away. Is it, will it be the Roswell wreckage that they'll show us? Will they show us parts of a trip? of a ship where they start re uh, revealing us real footage of, you know, uh, meetings, let's say with Eisenhower and ET. I mean, hang on to your hat, hang on to your hat. I think the revealing of the extraterrestrial presence 
will happen sooner than anyone thinks. There's also something I call the coming great deception. These are not friendly ETs from Zeta Reticuli, in my opinion, um, that we're looking at a whole different thing. I call it the coming great deception. And there's a, a saying I coined about a year ago. We go up, they come down. We go up, they show up. There's a scripture which talks about the rapture of certain people and certain fundamentalists will go. It's a very small minority of people. It's not like millions and millions and millions. It, it's enough to make a notice. But most people will look at this and say, well, these, these people like me, like L.A. Marzulli, were religious. They were ultra religious. They believe in, you know, and, and they're just not ready for this, this raise of consciousness. They're not just ready for this great paradigm shift we're having. This is all part of the great deception. I've written books about it. I've called it a priori before the event. It's coming because it was written about an ancient prophetic text. And we're on the cusp of it. The great deception is is will happen. But we go up, they show up, in my opinion. Well, I'm glad to hear you're optimistic about it. So with that being said, we'll bring this interview to an end. Uh, you can take a couple minutes now, get out anything you like, and also your contact info. And, um, well, I'll, then I'll wish you luck on everything. So what do you want I appreciate you having me on. It's been a great romp. I'd love to do it again. Um, again, the DNA evidence, that's our, that's our big thing on our calendar right now. Uh, that's February 2nd at the Marriott. There's 250 seats. I know we, we we had it at a smaller venue, 75 people at the same hotel, sold out in a couple of hours. So it, admission's free, but we will be live streaming it. That'll probably be on um, lamarzulli.net, links all over the place. Uh, we will be we're creating a, a DVD, which will be about probably two hours in length, as well as a book. This is groundbreaking information on the enigmatic, elongated Paracas skulls. And what we have found is astounding, in my opinion, which is why we are calling a formal press conference. And again, as I stated earlier, you know, we are bringing in um, some some great people uh, in, into the um, uh, to be speaking. Brian Forrester, Marcia Moore, Richard Shaw, Rick Woodward, Dr. Malcolm Warren, a chiropractor, Chase Klosky, Mondo Gonzalez, our archaeologist, and Dr. Michael Alde. Everyone will be presenting. It is a conference from 1 to, 1 to 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time at the Marriott. More, more information, lamarzuli.net, lamarzuli.net. If you're interested in UFOs, check out my uh, hour and a half long uh, uh, film. It's called, in their own words, UFOs are real. And you can watch that on Vimeo, LA Marzuli, LA Marzuli.net, LA Marzuli on Vimeo, LA Marzuli on YouTube. Thanks for having me on. Really appreciate it. And thanks for what you do. And thanks for what you do too. Take care now and good luck. Bye-bye.